Welcome to the Your Message Received Podcast. And now, taking your message to the finish line, your host, John Duffin. Hey folks, John Duffin here with Duffin Media. Welcome back to another episode of Your Message Received. Your Message Received is the podcast, the place to help you find your best, most true, most authentic business voice. Hell, your most authentic voice. Get what you want, find what you need, improve your results, make billions of dollars, find the person of your dreams. All right, like I can't promise you all those things, but I can promise you a fair amount of things, helping you sound more true and authentic. And we love the fact that you keep listening, keep watching us on YouTube and iHeartMedia and Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all those other places that you find your podcasts. Keep liking, keep watching, listening, sharing, subscribing, and we will keep delivering the goods. And one of those ways that we do that is we bring people onto the show who walk the walk. It's these people who absolutely are, in my eyes, authentic, true, and speak from the mind and the heart that get me there a little bit faster and hopefully they'll get you a little bit faster too. And folks, today, we have no exception. So I have a friend of mine who has helped me speak more authentically because he does the same. If you are listening to Usula, watching and listening on Usula Media, you will know my guest. Um, He's also a fixture in the Philadelphia region who knows his way around a political roundtable. Fernando Mendez, thank you so much for joining me, sir. Well, Thank you, John. Well, here I am. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm counting on you, as you you promised, that I could make billions or, or oh, uh, get oh, better I'm... looking. <clears throat> one of those things. We 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 give all those tips later on in the show, and so right, make sure you have a pen and paper handy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, people right still here, have, have pen have... and papers. There you go. Nice, nice Here's paper, okay. folks. I... Here's the end before the beginning, which is one of the things that is great. Why I am such a fan. By the way, um, Fernando and I used to live in the same building in Philadelphia, PA, and that was the first opportunity that I got to know Fernando, that I got to know his wife. It, It was a great thing. And then the professional relationship was forged. Fernando and I, I... Fernando has been nice enough to invite me multiple times to his current hit show called Compass on Usula Media. But I'm telling you, it's it's been such a gift to hear you speak. Fernando, walk me through what got you rolling with Usula Media. What got, like, where did the opportunity come from that you could in, in its host, uh, one more time, host your own show? Well, uh, thank you, John. Thank you for the plug. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, it's one of those things. You know, they always say it's a long story. This is really a long story that I, I will try to uh, make brief. Um, <clears throat> uh, as you know, I was a teacher for a long time, mm-hmm. teacher at St. Joe's Prep. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> um, I found other ways to get engaged. And I I started doing interpreting and translations and anyway. So through a friend of mine, I ended up involved in Telemundo. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to uh, write commercials for them. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote the commercials, you know, you you know, those boxes that you fill with the, you know, images and then below that the script. Do you mean the storyboards? Right, right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I know you're familiar with them. Anyway, so I was I, in broadcast television for 30 years. I've seen a storyboard, man. Um, I am an ignorant slob. I'm sorry. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah. So I I did this storyboard and um whatever. Then then they would go with the camera and right. shoot the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So one day they and I don't know who was doing the voiceovers, mm-hmm. or you, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so they came to me one day and said, um, the, the voice person is out. Can you do the voice? Mm-hmm. I said, well, I'll give it a try. Let me let me see. I can read. 
So and you sound great. So, so you know, I doing it. So that's what that's what happened. I I started reading and and doing the commercials. Mm -hmm. I ended up doing about twelve hundred commercials for for Telemundo. Oh my god! Time. Oh my god! That's amazing. Uh, <clears throat> so after that, I mean, they sold the station at at one point. Right. Uh, Dan Slape was a businessman from uh, Wilmington. Mm -hmm. He had bought the station, and we had it. The station was at that point on Delaware Avenue and Spring Garden. And, and that, that building there, at the bottom was a, a famous uh, disco thing called Egypt. <laughs> I uh, saw Prince perform an after party at Egypt one time. I remember that place well, man. Um, so we were on the eighth floor there. Uh -huh. And yeah. So that was uh, that was uh, the 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 beginning of my involvement with um, Telemundo, right? Uh, another friend of mine had a magazine, mm -hmm. uh, and he asked me to contribute to the magazine. So I started writing pieces for the magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't last, so I ended up uh, opening my own newspaper. <clears throat> Oh my God. I started a newspaper called Latin Times, Tiempo uh, Latino, by, bilingual. At that point, it was cut and paste. There was no computers even. This is the dark ages of media. What did uh, you cut and paste with the, <laughs> the I would actual cut, pages? <laughs> oh, oh, no, well, no. I, I would print. Yep. I would I would type right. something oh my and, God. and send it to the printer. Uh, right. and, in the same office, mm -hmm. the page will come out, then I'll cut it and paste it onto a, a larger page where the newspaper was, you know, with it with the title. Anyway, the dark wow. ages, I'm telling you. <clears throat> wow. So uh, and then um uh I didn't stay long with that. I, I had um, I, I hired two people from the mm -hmm. neighborhood. At 2 a.m. in the morning, I was at Fifth and Allegheny, the Badlands. <clears throat> oh my God! So at 2 a.m., you're you're hovering, you're trying to get a publication rolling. You're yes. cutting and pasting, literally <laughs> in this case, cut it and cutting and pasting, and you're trying to and you're you're also have two people under you as well. Too. I had I had. <laughs> I not even to ask you the NFL films part. Is this going on during that? Are you juggling this many balls, or right now are you dedicated to? Not, not yet. I was not involved in uh, NFL okay. films yet. Um, at that point, that was, that was um, an attempt to to uh, sort of have my own my own newspaper. And, yeah. And, uh, anyway, so at, at two a.m., this big guy knocks on the door of the office. Uh, at the top of the the, the building belonged, or yeah, I think belonged to um, a lawyer, okay. Andrew Gay. Mm -hmm. Andrew Gay, Gay and Chucker. I don't know. You I know remember that. them. Yep. Anyway, so he let me have the space for nothing. I said, "Hey, thank you," because I make no money with wow. it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was making a little bit with uh, advertising and all that. Yep. So I hired this this guy who came in knocking on the door at two a.m. He says. Uh, we we we're from the neighborhood. We can watch your car. We we like you. We know who you are. <laughs> I said okay. So when they watched your car, did they need money or did they just watch it for free? Well, you know the boys who are selling drugs in the corner. You know, <laughs> so they were they were very nice. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, sure. He said, well, can can you give me a job? So well, I I, I cannot pay a lot. But mm -hmm. you can distribute the papers. He said, "Well, me and my buddy, we'll, we'll distribute the papers. They're good." So I was paying them peanuts, you know, for mm -hmm. around hundred, right. two hundred a week. And uh, so then he came to me a couple of months later and said, "I cannot do this anymore. My girlfriend is pregnant. I have to leave. I'm sorry. Okay, I have to go make real money at the corner." <laughs> 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 but I like oh. that they gave you notice. I think that's very professional. And that was very professional, that came in, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and then um, anyway, so that was the end of the of the paper. In other words, mm -hmm. because I didn't have any money to distribute, I couldn't do everything. So how could you? Um, and then 
So I ended up writing editorials for El Sol Latino mm -hmm. newspaper. Yep. Ricardo Hurtado. Oh, I know Ricardo. That's he's, awesome. He's been that for about six years, right? So uh, I, I worked for that paper for mm -hmm. more than 20 years, mm. writing all the editorials mm -hmm. and editing articles and blah, blah, blah. And contributing to other publications, Aldea, uh, Impacto. Mm -hmm. Impacto Latino was, uh, was uh, another Colombian uh, guy. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the Colombians were dominant in the media. We were in Telemundo. Mm -hmm. We were El Sol newspaper. Sol. And Impacto. Aldea. Mm -hmm. Aldea was Colombian too. Uh, or right. He's still, I mean, he's... He, well, Hernan and, and uh, Ricardo, right? I mean... Hernan Guaracao. Uh, Mm -hmm. And also Impacto, Napoleon Garcia was... Uh, I remember, uh, I know, I remember Napoleon. So for some reason, all the Colombians were dominant in the media. Uh, I don't know. Maybe because we can spell better than other people. I don't know. Fernando, when you're, like, at this time, writing the editorials, like, were there, were you writing political narratives? Were you writing community narratives? Some of a all the above what well, in your back then and that's not that long ago really i mean for god's sake you wrote for right what was the mindset of the thing like what were the messages you wanted this, to convey? this is going through the 90s and early 2000s okay so 2010 gotcha so um, what sort of in your mind back then what, what I was, were the messages I was, you wanted to convey well um um, middle of the road, uh, politically speaking. Okay, uh, got it. Gave it to both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and my main topics were, you know, complaining about education. Okay, right. Uh, one of my good friends got me really involved in that. And you might remember this name, Alice Leon Motes. Absolutely. He used to write the editorials for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Yep. And that was one of her pet peeves with the state of our schools. Mm -hmm. So I picked up that topic from her. Um, may she rest in peace. I, I remember her. I, I she was, but she was an excellent writer. And by, right. by no means would I compare myself to mm -hmm. Alice Leon Motes. But um, so that's what I was doing. I was writing editorials about education, about um, national and international news. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I wrote about. Uh, uh, the conflict with Russia. I, I tried to explain why we spent so much of the 20th century mm -hmm. concerned with the Soviet Union and why we so many times were naive. Americans were naive in terms of politics. Amazing that we have the best brains in the world. Right. And in many instances were naive. I will just give you one example. Please. We underestimated Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. We underestimated um, uh, Nicaragua, the, the, mm -hmm. the Sandinistas. Mm -hmm. you know, all, all along, they got away with stuff that nobody else could. Then that gave rise to this, this spread of communism throughout Latin America. Mm -hmm. Fidel Castro had, had a big uh, to do with that because he and Che Guevara spread it all throughout the continent. Right. And my pet peeve was, where are we? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Uh, what are we disengaging? Why did Chase Manhattan and all these banks moved out of Brazil and 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 so South America, and we opened the way for China and and uh, uh, Japan and other people to come? In. There was a friend of mine, Peruvian, who took a plane from Madrid to Lima and said, uh, "I swear to you, eighty percent of that plane was Chinese people with uh, portfolios to do business in Peru." In Peru. Let me ask you, when you're writing back then, and, and, and these obviously these topics were, were critical, what was the feedback you were getting? Because I can't imagine you had a ton of other competitors that were writing those pieces. How were people receiving those pieces? Yeah, well, you know, one of those things that we, we, we lacked the means to get the feedback. We, okay. I would only occasionally, right. uh, if I went to a meeting, Mm -hmm. um, I, I want, I'm one of the founders of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce I guess, other, yep. with mm -hmm. Angel Ortiz, with oh my uh, god, yeah, with, with, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Uriel Rendon, all mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
when we go to meetings, that's when I would hear from people. Okay. I really yes. Really told you about this. Mm -hmm. You are right or you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be saying that. You know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, but it, I, that's when I would hear. We didn't have a, a regular channel for feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a. There was a space on the page of if we got letters or anything, but that was really rare. Oh, when you think about it, even back then, yeah. Yeah. that required a lot of initiative that somebody would first have to formulate a counter opinion, then pull out the pen and write the letter and then send it. And that, and then by that time, you, you wonder, did the people think like, well, never mind, nobody's going to read this anyway. Exactly, um, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like a voice in the wilderness. I had no idea what it, what it hit, except we found out like later on right. that people at City Hall were listening and and reading, mm -hmm. um, because at some point in 2012, um, a man who ran for uh, mayor of Philadelphia, Ken Trujillo, bought a radio station. So we had mm -hmm. a radio program. Mm -hmm. With with a couple of my compadres, we we had a radio show uh, until two two thousand seventeen. Who were the compadres? Uh, Pedro Rodriguez mm -hmm. from the uh, Dominican Republic. He's mm -hmm. he's a well known uh, uh, figure in Philly. He oh yeah. Used to, he used to publish a, a, a scandal sheet in North Philly in the among the community. Always gossip. It was called La Cotorra. Ah. And, uh, and they had all these all these vicious attacks on on the political people in this town. Anyway, so no, he didn't, he didn't make too many friends. He and the publisher of that uh, pamphlet didn't make too many friends because that was in the tradition of the old guys who used to, you know, write letters and send them out and insult people and all that. That's that's what well, the, the old cliche, the poison pen. That yeah, exactly. In sense that it was like that. Fernando, talk to me though about that show that that back then that, that in essence. So here's the the opportunity that you get to express your opinions. Not to mention something that changed a little bit is you're not quite in the wilderness anymore, as you said. You've got literally somebody at the table, so to speak. What right. were those days like, where you're having these conversations and someone is there to hear it and respond? Yeah, that was interesting because we yeah. got phone calls. Okay, yeah, and, great. So uh, that was Pedro and then Victor Negron. I don't know if you know Victor. I know Victor um, Negron. See. And uh, Ken Trujillo joined us occasionally. Right. And my friend Emma Restrepo, who, who's, you know, she's a well respected uh, uh, journalist. Mm -hmm. she's, she has her own uh, uh, program mm -hmm. uh, called Dos Puntos. And uh, she just wrote an article for the Philadelphia Inquirer, mm -hmm. an interview with an immigrant who has a restaurant in Philly. So she's, you know, that she was on, on the show for a while. And um, those were the people. And, and the conversation was always about, you know, politics and, and banter. You know, we we would attack each other. Was a, you know, funny way, you know, we, people would think we hated each other. But we, <laughs> right after we uh, closed the program, we went over to the Front Street Cafe to have breakfast. To celebrate so, to celebrate a good show. Yeah, well, now, Fernanda, you're saying earlier that when you were writing, you were writing middle of the road politics. Yes. Like like when you back then, you're writing literally middle of the road politics uh as it stood. When you're on the show and you're speaking like at, at this point for the first time. Did you feel like you had to stay middle of the road or did you have to feel issue? You're saying you're kind of, you guys are going at it. In your mind, were you more interested in like getting getting listeners and or what have you, or was it getting your opinion heard? You know, it's interesting you ask uh, that because uh it it makes me think of, of what really happened, right. which is that that Pedro Rodriguez, who is mm -hmm. an avowed uh, leftist, mm -hmm. um, uh, he he put me on the defensive, uh, or, uh, and I, I had the need uh, to attack him. Okay. You can't say that. That's you know, that is ridiculous that you say that. And because it was one of the things that he wanted to create the perfect welfare state here, you know, I was like oh, okay. 
Uh, what, what, what is the, the incentive of people to go out to work? If you, wh Why can't we have a proper way to register the voter so that we don't have, you know, fraud? Why, why can't we... I, I believe, and I have always believed, and I will defend this point of view, mm -hmm. that I think... It, tell me how much time you need for every citizen to have an ID card to vote so that there's no confusion, there is no possible fraud. Here is my ID. Mm -hmm. I... I will vote. Tell me, oh, well, there are people who cannot leave their homes. There are people who, uh, whatever, any problems. Tell me how much time you need so that we provide it and the government will finance it, an ID for everybody to, to vote. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of discussion I had with Pedro all the time. So, and occasionally we'll, when we talk about uh, Putin and Russia and all that, yeah. I, I would call him Hijo de Putin. <laughs> that was one of, one of my favorite episodes for him so let um, me ask you are you part of the greater philadelphia hispanic chamber of commerce as that show was on uh i was i was no at that point let me mm -hmm. see at that show no i was not involved in the in the hispanic chamber at that here's point. why i'm asking it, yeah. that, that's fine why it, it's the feedback that you're getting now i love the fact like for instance because you're now like flexing your muscles so to speak in regards to really speaking your mind and and being able to say it in a more even aggressive fashion what's the feedback like now in terms of like with this show as it was i don't mean now when when that show was airing what was the feedback like well uh again it was through channels we would mm -hmm. we would uh we would know that maria quinones at city hall was listening mm -hmm. um, how'd you know uh because she would tell us or she oh would, there she, you go right <laughs> she would respond mm -hmm. to pedro was pedro has Mm -hmm. idiotic ideas most of the time almost sure. everything that came out of his mind was really not very smart okay. um so i i've i have told him in person so that's not a, a slander or whatever he knows <laughs> he, he knows he has a tiny brain so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> folks you might be noticing that that fernando has kind of stepped out of his shell just a little bit um <laughs> All right, so away from the tiny brain and Maria Quinona Sanchez literally telling you those sorts of things. Right, so uh, we had, uh, but not only her, we, we heard from other other council people. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, David O mm -hmm. who, who mm -hmm. has, has opinions on, on the Hispanic mm -hmm. community. He is, by the way, he's been a good councilman for, for everybody because he's, he's out in the street. He's out in the community. You can see him almost every meeting. Literally, you look exact. I agree with you, and yeah. that's kind of unusual, by the way. Yes, not a, not not all of them. And, mm -mm. I mean, he's more present in the city than the mayor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the mayor is. I don't know. He's been in hiding for a couple of years now. So, oh, I was going to say it. Let's see. We're two or three. This is the third year into the new. To the it's not new anymore. Yeah, I'm I'm going five years back. Uh, of a lot of quiet and i'll just for me I, it real gutsy for me to say but i'll just say hey mayor kenny if you're listening feel free to, to agree, call. disagree call whatever you need to do because i feel the same way as you fernando now i want to take yeah. a step backwards before we continue when you were a kid like you said you were like your teacher at st joe's prep right and 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 and, and you've and, and you were from academia were you always like feeling the need to speak a truth your truth or was it more important for you to in essence convey what others were like again in academia here's your textbook fernando teach them uh here you know that sort of thing were you always this free in regards to the way that you speak yes uh, and I was with my students, uh, always very honest in, in my mm -hmm. opinions. Uh, where do you think uh, that came from? Um, where did that come from? I don't know. I, I, it, was, it was sort of instinctive for mm -hmm. me, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I sort of had, a, had an idea that <clears throat> I am, and I, I, I've always been well-read. Mm -hmm. 
I, and especially, um, I used to read like the New York Times all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I watch television mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. news, mm -hmm. MSNBC, CBS, mm -hmm. CNN, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And so you, you, you said like, when you hear opinions that, that are uninformed, mm -hmm. clearly uninformed, mm -hmm. and you hear not only once, but twice, three times, mm -hmm. people expressing an idea that are clearly wrong, mm -hmm. you say, wait a minute, this is what it is. This, you know, and, and it, because I, I, uh, I, I admit that I'm relying on, on a certain uh, media that might, might have their own bias. Mm -hmm. I said, but that's why from different sources, you get, mm -hmm. you get that, that kind of opinion. The, honestly, I don't think that I would listen to Fox only because I know what they are about. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to because I, I can predict what they are going to say. Mm -hmm. From about it's, a mile away, at least is where yeah, I'm coming right. from. You know? but, but from all the other mediums, media, I can mm -hmm. get different opinions. I can get different information. Mm -hmm. I can gather, and then I, I, I gather my own thoughts. Because mm -hmm. I can make a judgment on, mm -hmm. on whether or not uh, uh, Donald Trump is a crook. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and I, I have thousands of pieces of information that mm -hmm. informed that opinion. So it's, substance it's and sourced and 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 easily fact right. like easily fact checked. That's the word I wanted. So look, we are back with Fernando Mendez Usa <clears throat> La Media. And one of the things that I now know from being firsthand being interviewed by Fernando is Fernando is a fantastic interviewer and Fernando has interviewed not just the heads of cities, Mayor Michael Nutter at the time, and a bunch of other VIPs, uh, but you've had a lot of interview practice. What do you think in your mind makes a good journalist, and what in your mind are the steps that you take that make you such a strong interviewer? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> that's an easy question and, and, and tough question at the same okay. time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the whole process is very organic mm -hmm. for me um i like to begin to put my my interviewee at ease okay so i try to inject some humor to begin with mm -hmm. uh for instance uh john street mm -hmm. he had had a really tough uh, primary race he was like you know everybody was attacking him and mm -hmm. So when he sat down, I said, well, now you can relax a little bit. The, the, you know, you, you, you have had a, a very difficult time, but uh, mm -hmm. this is a place to relax. He said, what do you mean? I said, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I'm not 60 minutes. You know, I'm going to ask you <laughs> simple questions. <laughs> so anyway, that made, him, that made him laugh that, that I, I thought he, he was. Makes me but, laugh, too. Me laugh. Hey, folks, if you're not listening from Philadelphia, <laughs> John Street was the former mayor of Philadelphia and, and during a very contentious time in the city. So I love all of that as well, too. What do you think, Fernando, makes you a good interviewer? Other than yeah. putting people at ease and was, what else? Like I said, yeah. you know, what else? Yeah, another example of that, I interviewed um, uh, Rebecca Reinhardt. Yep. Who's now running for mayor and she sure. was the uh, uh, controller, Philadelphia mm -hmm. controller. And so I had read in an article about her mm -hmm. that she liked to play ping pong. Oh my so God, I said, well, to open the interview, I said, well, first of all, I, I understand you like ping pong. Mm -hmm. And I think of myself as a good ping pong player. Mm -hmm. I challenge you to, to play. So she started laughing. She said, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. we'll play. Um, so that, that kind of, mm -hmm. that's, it helps mm -hmm. uh, to, to inject a bit of humor. Great. To, to, um and uh say in one more recent interview let's say uh um alan um uh, alan dom dom who is running for mayor uh in the middle of the interview we're talking about money he says this is gonna cost right. like 10 billion dollars mm -hmm. i said well alan you probably have that in your pocket right now <laughs> so i made him that uh so um that kind of for mm -hmm. inject humor mm -hmm. into an interview, mm -hmm. made the other people relax. Never, uh, 
just don't uh, forget to follow up. Mm. Whatever answer the, the, the mm. interviewee gives, follow up. Don't, don't go to your next question. I've seen the interviewers, even professional people, you know, big mm. networks, and, and they have a list of, of questions, and they just move on to the next question regardless mm -hmm. of what the, what the interviewee said. You know, he just said he, he killed somebody at the corner, and you just want to go on to the next question. Do you want to find out why he killed anybody? <laughs> Fernando, you haven't killed anybody, right? Uh, no. I just want to make sure, right? Because like, it would make for a great interview and, and I, a strong follow-up question. If you had said, yeah, um, <laughs> I'd have followed up harder. Yeah. You know yeah, what my else? Name is Big, my name is Big EC. <laughs> So I'll add one more thing. The humor, ease, you know, that, that's follow up. You're also really good in terms of being prepared. You talked about earlier how like a voracious reader, you know, and, and keeping up and things like that. Absolutely. And I watched you do that. Um, do your homework. So prepare a, a background on the person you go to interview. Even if it's like you only read one or two articles, that will give you enough to to sort of motivate other answers, mm -hmm. to, to follow up questions about something else. So you have to know something about this person mm -hmm. uh, to, to talk to them, to interview them. So in the case of Alan Down, for instance, I've known him for decades. Right. So I could ask him a couple of questions that... Nobody else would. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, I was telling my uh, sound engineer. Yeah. I said that well, without sort of, not not to sort of, uh, as the Mexicans say, alzarme el cuello, not, not to pretend that I'm so great. But I, I, I was telling him, I said, to get to where I am, mm -hmm. I said, so this is this wasn't an accident. This mm -hmm. was my studies, my interest in history, mm -hmm. my interest in languages. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that I can uh, put these thoughts together and, mm -hmm. and and reach a conclusion. I read philosophers. I read history. I love history. In fact, I love history so much that I put a lot of that in my lessons in in mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. And I had one of my best students, a black kid called. Adam Cooper. Okay. He 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 was a straight A student. Mm -hmm. He was so good, he took French, Spanish, and German. And he got A in all of them, on top of Latin and Greek. Oh my God. Okay. He was a genius. His brother was equally smart, but he he, he also a straight A student, but by, by pale by comparison. He Isn't it awful? He's the straight I'm thinking of the poor brother that, that was looked down upon, and he's only a straight A student. And me and this one is got five languages bouncing in the air simultaneously and okay. mastering all of them. Um <laughs> so anyway, so he I so I was curious. So I said, Adam, mm -hmm. uh, you you're a senior now. What what are you gonna right. study? He says Mm -hmm. I, I want to study cartography. I said, mm -hmm. what? You're going to start making maps? He said, well, I love that. He said, mm -hmm. and then I, re I remember that I always saw him in class with a map of the United States or the map of South America or, or something, always drawing and, and identifying the countries and all that. God. So this, imagine that, all these languages and what he wants to do is study maps uh, first off i can't imagine that and i'm sorry i want to be able to <laughs> i was so when i i worked folks and as you've been listening you know that i worked with univision communication Spang spanish language media for 12 and a half years and i know that the great good souls that work with me at univision how I knew my 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 espanol was was not great would be i would speak in spanish and and the Spanish language person would always answer me back in English. And that's how I knew that I wasn't that. Let me ask you something. So first off, I would like to meet that kid, but I'd also like to find out from you. I'm guessing that kid probably taught you something because that kid is going to teach everybody everything. But let me ask you, what can you think of of some of the best uh or a couple 
great things that you have learned from people that you have interviewed? What have well, they taught you? Uh, well, you always learn something from from uh, talking to people. From, yeah. Because I, I think more than interview, uh, I see these encounters as chats. It's a conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in which we exchange ideas and and uh, obviously a politician usually has a message he wants to convey this is what i'm going to do for the city mm -hmm. this is uh, who i am and this is how i prepare myself to mm -hmm. to be the mayor or to be a, a member of city hall you know whatever right uh, city council mm -hmm. and so you learn something from people uh, where you uh, never underestimate what is beneath the surface. There is mm -hmm. always somebody has a story behind you. You dig a little bit. If mm -hmm. you find it, that thread and pull it, and there it is. <laughs> There's a bit of a story. Right? So um, one thing I learned with, with my students, Yeah, uh, I told you I, I used to use history all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Especially in the case of Spanish, like right. in American history mm -hmm. and Spain, and all. I go with this, with Spain. I go all the way back to the occupation of Spain by the Roman Empire. So that's how far back I take them, and I bring them all the way to to the modern. Oh my God, so, Fernando, forgive me. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I'm so sorry. No, go ahead. Oh no, what I was was thinking is your foundation. So, folks, I've had I've mentioned it a couple of times. I've had the privilege of being interviewed by Fernando and or whether it was a collaborative chat, as you just said, that, hey, these are chats as I see them. I always have felt that way with you. They are chats. And that to me is probably what makes me so comfortable that I can feel free to speak my mind. So Usula Media, which is a digital streaming platform um, based in Philadelphia, PA, where I speak but also the media is, is has got ac outlets across the country in philadelphia you are now like i said that that's a strong place for you where in terms of of like right now who are some of the people that you'd like to speak to we'll say from like i said again you've got you've got a platform to do so who are some of the people that you'd actually like to speak to Either it, either to speak with them one more time or someone that you haven't spoken to yet. Like, who are some of the people that you'd like to be able to chat with? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, it, this will be more more like a, a, a dream, you know. Yeah, that's why I'm re asking. To reach uh, senators and... Uh, and exactly. And, uh, I interviewed um, uh, Bob Menendez. Mm -hmm. uh, that was you know, a long time ago. Yeah, um, but I wish I had that ability to reach them. Mm -hmm. That that uh, you know, New York Times people probably get a, one phone call and like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll be there. You know, mm -hmm. so we don't have that kind of reach. No. But that I would like to ha be able to do that. Other than that, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. telling you, I was thinking uh, just um, in the last couple of days, I would like to have a conversation or a series of conversations mm -hmm. about uh, crime in the city mm. and who would know mm -hmm. who the police commissioner mm -hmm. maybe right you know uh, try to talk to them mm -hmm. uh, try to a regular uh, a, a, a beat cop and say mm -hmm. what how do you see this what why is this mm -hmm. problem what does it seem like it has no solution mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what what do we do mm -hmm. uh, talk to somebody the, both sides of, of, of gun control, mm -hmm. people who want it and people who are opposed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of conversation, I would like to, in, in generic terms, find people who know something about that. I love it. Let's break that into two different pieces. So the first piece, the dreams and the lofty. If you have access to anyone, don't worry about the New York Times and one phone call or, you know, don't worry about the access. If you're the one that's picking up the phone and there's a good chance they will pick up too, who would you like to speak with? Well, I don't know that he would ever pick up the phone for me. Let's leave that part out. I would like to, I would like to, to reach Kevin McCarthy. Got it. What would yeah. you ask him? 
Are you crazy? <laughs> All right, so I love how clear and direct that question is. I love it. <laughs> Mr. McCarthy. By the way, I, know, I think I know the answer to that, but I'd rather have him speak <laughs> and say it out loud. Well, uh, I would probably wouldn't say that, but but I would say we are at an impasse here. We right. need to solve this problem mm -hmm. because otherwise it would be chaos, not only in the U.S., mm -hmm. but it, it has repercussions around the world. Mm -hmm. This budget ceiling... I mean, you you cannot impose uh, these uh, principles. What you want, the demands that you have right now, mm -hmm. are impossible for, for Biden to respond to. Mm -hmm. So he's waiting for you to come back to the table with, mm -hmm. with common sense proposals. With so, anything, with right. anything of substance and mm -hmm. removing the IRS is not a viable option. Uh, no. Hitting up people at every economic level with a 30% sales tax is not a viable option. Right. And holding the economy hostage with a debt ceiling freeze and ignoring the situation will just cripple everything. These are my opinions, nothing more, but I'm just saying, and, and this is why it's like these, what are the things that why I just said I would split this into two pieces. You, I notice, and you just said it about literally the case of just solving crime on a local level. And you were saying, I would talk to the cop on the street. I would talk to people on both sides of this. You can break things down to a very granular, let me try that again, a very granular level. That's how I want to say it. Uh, but also... <laughs> Certain words I, I stumble on. Um, but the other thing is that, but you also speak to people that are much loftier. It's one of the things that I think that, as I said, I think one of the parts of the problems with communications right now are the people at those larger levels only are expected to speak in sound bites because they're either only giving a few minutes of their time or they're just spouting off the party line. Um, right. You know, if you were able to have a conversation with Kevin McCarthy and, and say, for example, they don't love the question, are you crazy? Maybe they want to go with, with, with another, like, what would you say? I don't know that anybody can solve this problem, but I'm going to ask you, which is this, there has to be a way in my mind that there could be a more central person asking questions of either side so that you go on M msnbc which i watch and, and 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 they give the script that msnbc would like you go on fox news and i won't but they give the script that they would like what would you say cnn is supposed to be central and i don't really see that either is no, I don't there think a so. way that you think that, that it could be solved so that people could get a clear answer out of somebody that's not a soundbite. Right. Well, John, what what I look for mm -hmm. is not an answer to a leftist agenda or a right wing mm -hmm. agenda. Right. But a, a uh, an answer to a real question that mm -hmm. that's I want to find out. For instance, as I said, curiosity is one of those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. I said, like, Mr. McCarthy, mm -hmm. Donald Trump was politically dead and you went down to Mar-a-Lago and embraced him and resurrected him. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? Mm -hmm. Because now you're saddled with a Trump that Republicans don't want. Apparently, every Republican you talk to says, somehow we're waiting for a solution from outside. Maybe he will die. Maybe maybe he will get tired of this mm -hmm. and leave. Maybe, you know, they are waiting for the Deus Ex Machina to come and, and solve the problem for them. They don't have the cojones right. to say, you know, this guy has done too much damage to our party. Mm -hmm. Three elections in which we lost. We mm -hmm. lost seats. We lost our position. We mm -hmm. lost the respect of the people. How do we get it back? Mm -hmm. But you did it. You mm -hmm. destroyed any possibility of getting rid of Trump. Why? That's what that would be my question. Uh, another one would be Mitch McConnell. And I would say, 
pretty much the same. Not, not so much because he, he didn't go to Mar-a-Lago, but he has remained silent through all the BS that Trump mm. has put out. Right. Mitch McConnell is still on his side. And mm. why, Mr. McConnell, when you were asked what you would do when you mm. came back to power, why did you say, I will tell you when we get there? That is cynical. Mm-hmm. And you know that that's not right. Are you hopeful that someone is capable of asking those questions? If it's not you, are you hopeful that we can get to a place where someone's actually asking the questions? Because that sounds like right now, almost a fantasy. Because everybody is so protected, so to speak, that, you know, mm-hmm. Are you hopeful? Do you think that there's a way that we crack that, we crack the ice on that? Well, there are two things about this. There are probably a couple of reporters who can do it. There's one guy from the New York Times. Uh, He's on MSNBC a lot. He just wrote a book, Schmidt. uh, Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then there is the other guy, uh, also his name escapes me. Mm -hmm. He has interviewed people and he he had like his I think he's he has a, like an English accent. Okay. And and you always see him with the the notebook, another page, and he has questions. Very respectful. Mm-hmm. He would somebody I, if I remember his name, I'll let you know. Okay. But, <clears throat> so there are two people who who can mm-hmm. do that at least that I know. Mm-hmm. There are probably more because there are many um, news people who are really capable and well trained mm-hmm. and well informed. Mm-hmm. But the problem is these politicians are not going to expose themselves to that. Mm-hmm. Mitch well, McConnell that's the hopeful fighting. question. That's really the question. Not who we can phrase the words, but are you hopeful that sometime someone will answer the question? No. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, I saw an interview with uh, Kevin McCarthy. Right. And the, the question was, uh, in regards to this debt ceiling or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. The question was, oh, the one he, he evaded mm-hmm. and he swallowed hard and then he he uh, evaded completely was, mm-hmm. what about George Santos? Why did you, why why do you defend him and why have you appointed him mm-hmm. to, to some uh, committees? Mm-hmm. Why? And he, his response was, well, the people of New his York. Conti- voted his for constituents him. voted for him. Right. That was his question, his answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. So then, and, and to me, the only way, my just rando personal opinion, which is the only way any of this gets solved, it's not that there are people that don't have the guts to ask. It's not that there are people that don't have the brains to formulate a good question. It, it's, it's, I, the scary thing for me is that individuals are allowed to stay insulated and mm-hmm. and, and, and have these protective cocoons, so to speak. Right, and right. so it, it, it's the ability to freely answer. And right now, I don't believe we have that forum. Um, and that's where it's like for you as a journalist, for you as an interviewer, for you as a historian, are you hopeful that, that something like that, that shell can break? Well, uh, John, we are at a point in our history, in our relationship, right? Uh, media and politicians, mm-hmm. uh, uh, voters and politicians, mm-hmm. where um, they can, they can, because Trump did it. Now, what is true mm-hmm. is false, and what is false is true. Right. So we are at some point in which nothing makes sense. Mm-hmm. Obama put it in more eloquent mm-hmm. ways, you know, speaking about all this double speak mm-hmm. that doesn't mean anything, doesn't answer any questions, mm-hmm. because nobody, nobody, uh, I mean, everybody can get away with not telling the truth, with right. uh, or exaggerating, mm-hmm. distorting, uh, saying things that are not true, that cannot prove anything, but they just say them. And then it, by repetition, they become reality. 
the, the election of 2020 was stolen. It was corrupt. And they repeat that every day in every corner of the of the globe. It all of a sudden people are people who even doubted at the beginning are thinking maybe mm -hmm. maybe it did happen. Well, maybe it did. Uh, what yeah. if it did? What if it? What? Well, what? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, Obama spoke of epistemology, uh, which is mm -hmm. a study of knowledge, and mm -hmm. and. That's what what he said. You know, there's there is no there is no knowledge right now. There is no nobody nobody knows anything. No, because you know what's true and true false. Fernando, one of the biggest reasons I I admire you and why you and folks, this is addressed to you too. Why it's so important to speak your mind, and I was terrible at it for a lot of years, so I'm not telling anybody what to do, but why it's so important is because the only way to me, to me, that you affect change, real change, is when everyone is literally speaking from a point of knowledge, history, sourcing, and courage and Fernando, I believe that's all of you. And now we just need a few more people that that get into your corner as well, too. You know, um, that could speak again with conviction, but also with actual sourced facts. So let me ask you, like to, to wrap up, I got one more question for you for now. For now, oh no, I'm sorry, I lied too. Uh, number one, will you come back? Absolutely, any oh. any time. Love it. All right. That was that that was the one I was worried about. All right, great. I, I would love John, yeah. I, I would love for us to be a team uh and and have a, a show where we, we can both contribute. We, we we pick a topic and say, like, this is what I found out, this is what I know. Mm -hmm. This is like maybe we agree, maybe we don't. Mm -hmm. Let let's see how how do we pair those different opinions. Mm. I yeah. love that sort of thing. It's one of the things as timing goes. And first off, thank you. I'm flattered. I want to explore that opportunity. Uh, I'm flattered for all of that stuff. And the second question, the last for just this moment, just this moment, it would simply be this. Who inspires you? Wow. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, um, a lot of deep thinkers. Mm -hmm. Um in in politics, I've, I, and I I have quoted this person forever and ever. Mm -hmm. um, is a philosopher Santayana. Mm -hmm. uh, people who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it, mm. and that is in the that's one of the is it the epilogue in in one hundred years of solitude mm -hmm. by Garcia Marquez. Mm -hmm who don't remember the past are condemned to, to repeat it. Mm. Mm. Um, I have admired uh, JFK, the only president who actually put real money in Latin America, $20 billion in 1960 money, 20 billion with a B, mm. that, that was used to upgrade airports, build schools, feed children, mm -hmm. help the poor. That that's one person who had a tremendous impact, mm -hmm. and every U.S. president since then has been handicapped in, with respect to Latin America. As I said earlier on, a lot of them are naive about Latin America, mm -hmm. because Venezuela should not be where it is, mm -hmm. should not be allowed to fall into the hands of the leftists. Nicaragua, look what Chile for all the for all the complaints from the left about Chile, it was saved. I'm sorry, Salvador Allende is a hero to the left, mm -hmm. and and Pinochet was the devil, and but somewhere in between is the solution. It's not, not the right, not the left. It's somebody like like Bill Clinton governed this country from the middle, from, from the, the middle, center, taking ideas from everybody. Mm -hmm. Lincoln put a cabinet together. It was a team of what rivals. That's a whole book by Doris Kerwood, um, Goodwin about uh, about Abraham Lincoln, how he put this cabinet of people from really opposite points of view. And so I admire that. 
I love the fact that, again, as I said, that it all comes down to giving people the opportunity. The, your, the sources, oh, and, and if you're going to take it, John Kennedy, with the 20 billion with a B, as you say, that is it to really affect change, you have to be all in. Um, and so I love the sources of inspiration. You inspire me, and I'm so damn grateful that you took the time for me today and for all of us. I know where to find you on LinkedIn. Where is the best place? Where do you want people to find you? Well, right now, Usala Media um, is Usala Media Network. That's what you had to uh, put into the uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, blog. I'll Usala tell you Media what, we'll Network. put your link in there. So Usala Media Network, what we'll do, folks, to make this even easier is we will. I will have that link in the bio so that folks, as you are listening and or watching, you will see that link. You just click it um, because my friend Fernando has a show that's called Compass that to me is really important that you pay attention to. Um, Thank you, John. I think you, you, you'd be a great PR man. <laughs> Except I have no money to pay you. That, oh, we'll see that. Then that presents be, a problem. But we'll other than pro that. Bono. We'll be pro bono. <laughs> My life in a nutshell. Life in, life in pro bono land. But the fact of the matter is, Fernando Mendez, thank you so, so much for making the time. I thank am you, thrilled that you were thank here, you. sir. I'm this very grateful. Wonderful. Yeah, I'd be willing to do it again anytime. Give me that a call. Makes me, that makes me very happy. Folks, you've just heard another episode of Your Message Received. I am John Duffin here from Duffin Media. Thanks so much for continuing to check us out. Please listen, watch, like, subscribe, tell your family, whatever. Um, and we'll keep coming back for more. Have a great rest of the day, folks. Thank you so, so much for checking us out. And we'll be back soon. Bye-bye. And now, making its way across the finish line, your message received has been a production of Duffin Media.